happy Monday and welcome to another episode of the Sneak Preview, a Filmgasm Productions podcast that follows the current film calendar. I'm Connor Izagari. I'm Caleb Lachey. In today's episode, we'll cover three of this past weekend's releases. Prime Video's Jolt, the G.I. Joe reboot Snake Eyes, and M. Night Shyamalan's latest attempt to reclaim his career, Old. Overall, a fairly shitty weekend, so bear with us. Uh, Christ, I mean, this is this is weak, weak shit. For I mean, we're 30, like 30 at least episodes into this show, which means 30 weeks of film. And this is embarrassing. I mean, this is, you know, January 2008 embarrassing. <laughs> like, give us something good. This is July. Like, this is summer movie season. I get there's been a pandemic, but that doesn't mean the quality of the films should have been affected. I'm dude, uh, dude, like, look, I, as a lot of people probably know by now, like, for our dedicated fans, which I'm sure we have somewhere out there. Thank you. Um, you know, I came off, I'm off, you know, I'm, couple, I'm gonna, what, I'd say a few months removed now from a 11 month deployment. So I missed like that whole pandemic, right? And I didn't get to see, I wasn't initially at theaters, obviously, when they opened back up. But since I have been back and been back to the movies, this is, yeah, this is hands down been the most pathetic weekend of film releases I've sat through. Dear God, like, even when we had those seven movie weekend release weekend, the five movie weekly, there was at least one thing I really liked, one, and maybe, and then everything else was okay at best. I don't think, at most, I think on both those weekends, the lowest I gave anything was a six note, those five, can power milkshake. Uh, but at least, like, those were just like, you know what? They weren't great, but they also weren't, like, the worst thing I sat through ever. But this weekend, I was – it was painful. I'm already – for three films now, I sat – one at home, two in the theater. Just sitting there looking at my screen like, is this everyone a fucking in? Like, I don't want to watch this anymore. Honestly, the most positive thing of this weekend for me was that I finally didn't have to do a fucking Fear Street movie. <laughs> but I would have hoped for something, you know – better i should have known you know prime their output has been just terrible uh gi joe can't fucking land anything and it's m night Shyamalan. what did i expect so really it's kind of our fault yeah <laughs> We're expecting more from this <laughs> God. well before we get into all that let's take a look at what happened last week in film last week in Phil. So many trailers. Dear God, I was not expecting a trailer a day. Uh, first up, Jackass Forever. Hmm? So it wasn't even Comic-Con yet. And we had trailers at the ass. Yeah, it was like the, the lead up to Comic-Con was just like, hey, here's some extra shit every single day. <laughs> yeah, I I'm guess not complaining, it's just weird. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess because honestly, Comic Con has been nothing but TV trailers. So I guess they were just getting the movie trailers out of the way. Because I've noticed, like this past weekend, I've seen a shit ton of TV trailers stuff I'm interested in. But I know it's yeah. like films and afterthought these days. I don't like that. Uh, so first up, we got Jackass Forever, the long-awaited fourth Jackass film starring Johnny Knoxville and his motley crew of idiots with a death wish. It's theaters October twenty second, and um, I know you're really pumped for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Finally, that a trailer. What do you think? It honestly, it looks good. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm very pumped. Uh, what I, you know, what I really like about this trailer is, um, so I'm sure there are people, you know, I'm not gonna go over like why I like this because we did that already, but uh, you know, a lot of people obviously are looking at the brand like, ah, Jackass, really? Do we need them? They're like 50. Like, why are they doing this? I like how within like the first 30 seconds of the trailer, they make they crack a joke about it. Uh, Chris Pines is like, you're probably wondering what does Jackass look like more in our 50s. Well, definitely more mature. And then they immediately follow with a stunt. So, like, I appreciate that they are very, very aware of, like, they're not the young guys they used to be. And this movie really, I know Knoxville said in an interview already that this is it after this movie. So this feels like, not necessarily like we want to do it for the money, but, like, we want to at least show that we have at least one more in us before we, you know, hang, hang the hat. And that's what I got from the trailer. And... You know what? I'm not the only one that's going to enjoy this trailer because for both old and snake eyes, 
this trailer played before the movie is, and the audience reaction more to this fucking two and a half minute trailer than either of the movies I sat through. <laughs> I I just want to take this moment to say that I got up to pee in the middle of Snake Eyes and I came back and I hadn't missed anything, and that is sad. <laughs> but yeah, Jackass Forever. I, it looks it looks funny. It's Jackass, you know. It's this isn't Citizen Kane. We all know what we're going into here, <laughs> so it's, enjoy it. Yeah, it, it looks like it's going to be the dumb fun, you know, like, and I, I was laughing at numerous points in the trailer, like when he gets launched into the ceiling, <laughs> the store cracks me up, or like the little joke when he's like, you know, uh, Steve was in this cast, and Knoxville's like, at least you got your million dollar teeth, right? And he just pulls out his fake tooth immediately. I hope the guy who is going to be like in the room with the bear is okay, because that looked uh, oh. or, uh Aaron, there you go, yeah. <laughs> they do a lot of fucked up shit from those. I, I'm sure you'll do your research and well, at least watch the first week before this one comes out. I'm gonna watch all three movies, yeah. Okay. Um, but they did one skit where they like put like uh, a, a thing of floss, whatever, like dental around its tooth and attached her into the Lambo and tr- pulled it out that way. I've seen that. I've, I saw that one. <laughs> Jesus Christ. They do a lot of fucked up shit to them, so. Yeah, well, you know, I'm happy no I'm happy no one died in this production. I figured somebody was gonna break their neck or some shit. Their no, arms gonna I, finally give out. Right. I do like how at the end of the trail they put on there like don't you nor any of your dumb little friend dumb little friends attempt anything you're seeing in this movie. Like they're just like, look, don't fucking try it. Like we're barely above the line to do this. Like <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. On the other side of this, we've got malignant. James Wan's new horror movie comes out September 10th. Uh, this has been kind of talked about for a while. You know, James Wan's doing a new horror movie. I think this is why he didn't direct Conjuring 3. Uh, I think it was one of the reasons. I think it was like between this and Aquaman 2. And it, Well, I was about to say the Universal movie he's directing. The Universal Monster movie. I forget which one he's directing, but I think he's only in the pre on that. So, I th- I'm pretty sure he's doing Frankenstein. Uh, yeah. I want, yeah, I, I thought I heard him get confirmed from one. I just don't remember the movie because they damn near announced every single Universal Monster right after the success of The Invisible Man. So they always do that. They never just hold off on it and just enjoy the success. They're always like, it worked. Green light, everything. Now, I, mean, I knew it was going to happen. Invisible Man was like the key to like, if this does good, we're doing the rest. But dear God, there was no like, all right, now let's do this with the knowledge that there was a coming. It was like, here's all of them. They're all coming. I was like, Oh shit, now I'm losing track of which one's coming out first and who's directing what. Lady Winnell's directing another one. I, I don't fucking know what's going on anymore. Yeah, Wolfman. Uh, well, we got Malignant, the latest evil adjective to get a film after Insidious, Sinister, Demonic, and Malignant. It's really making me laugh. <laughs> and that evil is a TV show, so let's get that one. <laughs> there you go. But this looks creepy as shit. James Wan's track record speaks for itself. And uh, this guy knows how to scare people. Uh, and this just looks really creepy. Invisible, you know, um, imaginary friend, demon thing looks creepy. I'm on board. Yeah, dude. You, as, first off, the moment he announced that I was on board, right? It's Yeah. Things are pretty given that everyone on Filmgasm likes James Wan, loves James Wan. Yeah. But now you're telling me that this is James Wan meets Giallo? Fucking sign me up. Fuck yes. The trailer. I was already sold. This trailer got me more sold. Fuck yeah. I am in on this movie. It's it's really cool to see that he's not abandoning his core roots. And he is still doing like, because he said he wanted to do this to kind of return back to his roots to do something smaller. So to see him kind of come off like Furious 7, Aquaman, you know, he's doing Aquaman 2 right now. To go back and do the, this small little horror film. Fuck yeah, bring it on. Looks so good. Yeah, the guy, you know, he directed two <laughs> billion dollar grocers with Furious 7 and Aquaman. He's got, you know, he's the directed a multi, I think, I think it's, re- you know, Conjuring's of over a billion at this point. I mean, he has three hit franchises, Saw, Insidious, and Conjuring, and the horror. I mean, the trailer even tells you, remember, it says, yeah. when the director of Saw, it, make sure you know, like, this is his new one. But I'm saying, like, he doesn't need to do this. Like he doesn't need the money, he doesn't need the notoriety. This is entirely a labor of love. You can you can tell. So, yeah, this is going to be something special. 
there's gonna be something special and i can't believe i'm saying this because i'm all i'm all i'm a little tired of franchises but you think it's gonna go four for four on fucking franchises here <laughs> you think we're gonna get malignant too <laughs> i don't know i maybe probably <laughs> if he creates in our franchise i'll be slightly impressed i'll be like god damn is there anything you can't touch that isn't near a billion dollar movie or starts a franchise in the horror genre <laughs> <laughs> we will see well, oh, wait, that was the, the movie, Dead Silence. That was a dud for him, even though I would defend that movie. Yeah, but that's early on. We all, everyone fucks up early. Yeah. Except for Spielberg, he came swinging. <laughs> he came out swinging with Jaws. <laughs> yeah. He came swinging. He kept going. I would say when he started focusing more on his uh, Oscar movies is when I kind of lost a little bit. It's just because just it seemed like he wasn't having fun anymore, really. But then he did Ready Player One. I was like, ah, oh, there's a fun Spielberg I like. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Next up, we've got 645, a Groundhog Day-inspired horror thriller that, uh, for some reason, is going to be coming out exclusively in Regal Theaters on August 6th. Uh, I saw the trailer for this when I went to see Old at my local Regal Theater. <laughs> and this is not the time to be narrowing down a film's release to one theater chain that's that's bad news this is gonna bomb so hard and i hope this never happens again (laughs) i yeah i don't know who what the move is by just doing one they're not exactly the biggest chain theater out there to begin with two like you said not the time i know i know regardless of i'm not going into politics stuff but the point is we're getting at the end pandemic regardless of what people are thinking about the delta variant or not just get vaccinated um we're getting to the end of the pandemic, but it's still scary times for a lot of people. And an award, and even without the pandemic, an award of streamers and all these other ways for you to get movies, like being exclusive to a theater, it's just not smart. No, it's not. And even like, I'd get it if this was like some, you know, indie darling that is like just wanting to know, like it's like was produced exclusively by Regal or something like that. But it's a horror, it's it's a horror Groundhog Day, which they've done. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen Happy Death Day, but I know it was a success. And I just don't think this is necessary. Like, who's this for? It's it just seems like a bad move across the board. Like this is just something that it it has to be to me, it just smells of something awful that just no one wanted. And Regal's like, oh, we'll show it. Yeah. So I'll see it, but I'm not, you know, I kind of want to pirate it just out of principle, you know, (laughs) I would, I would support you and stand by you, but uh, there's actually, there's not a regal near me. So it doesn't have my money. (laughs) Yep. There you go. I'm taking one for the team this time. Watch it be like the greatest movie of all time. Like the scariest movie ever, like an absolute masterpiece. And you can't see, if I see reviews for this are like nines, tens, I'll be like, I fucking hate you right now. You just read my review and it's just like, The Shining is dead to me. This is the new greatest horror movie of all time. Kneel before it. And you're just like, fuck. (laughs) At that point, I'm just going to double down. Be like, no, I will not watch it. Let's be honest. It's not going to (laughs) happen. No, it's not. This is going to be the last time anybody talks about this movie. Probably that's what's going to happen. Next up, Vacation Friends, a Hulu comedy starring John Cena and Lil Rel Howery that streams on August 27th. Actually, it looks pretty funny. Just, you know, the friends you make on vacation, you know, when you go home, you forget about them, but not this case. No, they don't forget about you. They crash a fucking wedding. <laughs> John looked- Cena's really proven to be a funny son of a bitch, so I, I think this is going to be interesting. Yeah, uh, it looks funny as hell. Like, like, like you said, I like John Cena's comedies. Um, like cock blockers, he's fucking hilarious in cock blockers or blockers. Sorry, that was a big point of contention when it was getting released. Much like when Zach and Mary make a porno was coming out. Um, yeah, but uh, he, he's funny. I like Lil Wayne Howery, he's usually pretty funny, you know, forever TS motherfucking A to me. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm concerned about is that it's going straight to Hulu, <laughs> as we'll discuss with a one of the three movies, the streamers are so fucking 50-50 that I'm always trepidatious when they 
The final trepidations with the new Hellraiser. I love the director attached. I am scared to death that it's coming to fucking Hulu only. Yeah, I think, you know, Hulu and Prime have the worst track record. Netflix, I, honestly, their, I odds, their odds are better because they greenlight fucking everything. So yeah, as well as, it's not the best way to, you know, even the odds, but they are doing it. Yeah, I must say, I put all three together because, I mean, yeah, Hulu and Prime don't come out as much shit, but very rarely is any of it good. And yeah, you're right, Netflix just does anything. So you believe in quantity over quality. But so much of that quantity sucks balls. Yeah, you're not wrong. It's yeah, I think it's uh it's a crapshoot and it does feel like the new direct to 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 video kind of thing. Yeah, I'll I'll talk more about that on Troll because I actually mentioned it already, but I'll, I'll give more into it on Troll. And yeah, it does. It really feels like this has taken the place of what you used to do back in the day with um Blockbuster. Hollywood video. For, for me, it was uh, the Video Shack. That's what they called it in Blanco. So shout out to Video Shack if you fucking remembers that store. <laughs> yeah, mine was Hollywood Video. I rarely went to Blockbuster. Um, well, we'll see with that. Next up, The Last Duel, a historical drama starring Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Adam Driver, and Jodie Comer, and directed by Ridley Scott. Comes out October 15th. And I can't believe there's no British people in this. I mean, you, you you think, you know, English court 15th century and you cast fucking Ben Affleck as the king of England? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> but, I, you know, maybe I'll be surprised. <laughs> maybe, but again, here's our director that he had great shit in his early career, but he's been so 50-50 in recent years to me. I love Ridley Scott. This is not a take on this is not a hot shot. Like Chad Ridley Scott. I love Ridley Scott, but his track record is like gladiator and then fucking he falls out of with like the counselor. <laughs> or like Prometheus and Alien Covenant. It's like, what the fuck happened, bro? Well, we did get the Martian. I was uh, yeah, so like that's what I'm saying. Like you'll get like okay, so you get like the counselor, then you get the Martian, and you're like, oh okay, cool. And then you get like Prometheus, and you're like, well, that was okay. And then you're like, oh, he's going back to do Alien. And then that Alien movie you're excited for is Alien Covenant. And you're like, fuck. Well, this feels like, you know, blatant Oscar bait. Uh, but also feels like it's not going to quite make it. Might get some, like, you know, production design nomination or costume design or something. But I feel like this is not going to make the splash they think it's going to make. But I, I could be wrong. It could be great. I hope it's great. Like, I want it to be more Gladiator, less Robin Hood, but yeah. Yeah. I'm pulling out all my fucking Scott movies. I have watched a lot of Ridley Scott. All right. <laughs> Fun fact for your fans I like Ridley Scott quite a bit. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know how to feel about this one. I, the, I mean, yeah, if you look at like the costume and wardrobe, it looks fantastic on a production level. Um, but it, yeah, it's weird that there's no British actors that. You got the most Bostonian motherfucker in Ben Affleck to play a British king. So it that's strange casting choices, but who knows? It could it could surprise us. Like I said, Ridley Scott's really 50-50 in more recent years. So I'm gonna put this whole fucking court in my rear view. Go birds. Oh, that's Philly. Go socks. My mistake. You might as well just cast Mark Robert in the fucking role. Oh my god. Yeah, that hasn't happened yet. He hasn't quite stepped into. I don't know. That's a, I think we've already fucked with Mark Wahlberg on this show. I, I remember doing that. <laughs> I don't remember when, but I know it happened. Was it when we watched Infinite? Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> oh, <ugh>. uh, <laughs> so after the last duel, we have Army of Thieves a prequel that I don't think fucking anybody asked for. Uh, it's a prequel to Army of the Dead. I I, I can't escape Zack Snyder. I, I thought I could. I can't. He pops up every few weeks. You know why he can't escape? Because Netflix loves him. So now he's never leaving. Why do they love him, though? Like, what did he give them? Because of his oddly rapid fan base. It's like the weird cult fan base he's created. No offense to my buddy, uh, EJ. I, I know you love him. And you know, power to you, buddy. Still a good friend. I love you, but I'm sorry. Don't like Zack Snyder. <laughs> he listens to the show, so I have, <laughs> I have to put that out there. 
I love that you, yeah, you, you throw that out every time Zack Snyder comes up as like a, you know, like a little umbrella there. And I, I appreciate that. Last thing I need is him like text me like, oh, I'm like, look, I'm glad you like Zack Snyder. I like early Zack Snyder. I don't like current Zack Snyder. This is how I should probably word it. Sometimes it feels like I'm in, I'm in fucking invasion of the body snatchers and I'm one of the few who has not yet been taken. <laughs> and I'm just like walking through and I say something bad about Zack Snyder. Somebody turns around and like shrieks at me and they all start running. <laughs> feels like I, that sometimes. I don't get it. it. Dude, I had someone like, they were like, hey, dude, I was on duty one day. This guy's like, hey, did you watch Army of the Dead? And I looked at him, I was like, yeah, I didn't really like it. He goes, what? He goes, I thought you were. I was like, no, I, I was bored for like two and a half hours. He's like, well, did you finally watch the Justice League? And I was like, oh, yeah, I finally watched the fucking four-hour cut. And he's like, and I was like, it was okay. Like, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. <laughs> and he's like, but I, I thought you would like that more. I was like, what, an overly indulgent movie that just makes superheroes be gods? Oh. And just hammers home the fucking god metaphor for four fucking hours? Fucking god damn it, Justice League. Sorry. Sorry. Lost it there. <sighs> yeah. Really, you really hurt that, that young man's feelings. <laughs> Point being, Army of Thieves, not really looking forward to because I thought Army of Dead's heist stuff was painfully generic. Well, I know that while I was watching Army of the Dead, I just thought, you know what? I really, really need to know the backstory of this nerdy little safe cracker because yeah. that's the only thing keeping me from truly enjoying this. And here we are. My prayers have been answered by the great god Netflix. <laughs> Thank you, Netflix. <sighs> it's like they took the part of like the part of um Army of Dead that I didn't like, which was the painfully generic heist part of the movie. They're like, do you want a full painfully generic heist movie? And we're going to pull that girl that from Fast and Furious that's one of the few bright spots in that and drag her into the exact same type of movie. God, these studios don't know how to fucking think like human beings. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. They just it's a constant, you know, assembly line of nonsense, and I'm I'm so tired of it. <laughs> like doing this show especially has shown me just how fucking similar almost you, every movie that comes are, out is. Are you slowly starting to see why I like some of the horror movies I like? Yes, because it's different at yes. the very least. <laughs> Yes, I was like, look, I'm not. I know I'm probably never going to change my mind on things like Texas Chainsaw Massacre too, but God damn it, it's different. It is fucking different. Like, you know what I fucking loved? Psycho Gorman. Josh picked it for last week's filmgasm, and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And I was glued. I was like, this is unique. This is a new I, experience. I like this. I won't lie. I texted Josh. I was like, I don't know if he's going to like it because I was like, I I liked it so much. I was like, I really don't want him to be like, fuck this movie. But then when you text me, like, oh, dude, I really liked it. I was like, oh, yes, yes. Y'all got to understand, fuck this movie does not mean fuck you. <laughs> you got to know that. <laughs> I know, but it still hurts sometimes. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I just, you know, like Jolt, for instance, I feel like we've seen something like this at least three times this year. And we'll get to it, but it's just something I noticed and Army of Thieves looks, you know, literally just taking the, the zombies out of Army of the Dead, the one thing people liked, and just making it a heist movie. Like, who the fuck thought that was a good idea? Yeah. Meanwhile, we're still waiting on the, the other prequel animated series, Army of the Dead Las Vegas, that actually shows that whole five-minute segment that I thought was actually a bright spot to that entire fucking movie, the, the title sequence, and that's the show. I, why is Netflix going putting like so much energy into an army of the dead shared universe. Like why, what is it about this one movie that is making them just say, this is it. This is the goal. Because of good old, uh, that the Snyder fan base, man, they are rabid for anything remotely Snyder. I'd get it. If he'd actually done work that is worth the, admiration but apart from like watchmen he really fucking hasn't I, look i was on like, like i said i was on board for watchmen 300 is on the dead remake and, but then like after those three films though i have yet to watch anything that made me go i really like this movie 
Because even Man of Steel, like, was probably the closest that he got to me actually liking what he is. But I get so tired of that fucking tone he adopted for it. Like, clearly yeah. trying to impress Nolan, but Nolan made better Batman movies. So stop trying to fucking suck his dick, dude. Did you hear about uh, the screenwriter of Man of Steel? I don't remember his name, but he said that he got the worst and stupidest note from a producer he'd ever gotten on, on Man of Steel. When he was, presenting the, he was presenting the script and the scene where they overload Superman's uh, like little ship, the, they overload the Phantom Zone projector and suck all the Kryptonians into the Phantom Zone. The guy was like, wait a minute. If he, that ship gets destroyed, then how is Superman supposed to go home to Krypton? And the, the guy had to be like really calmly without saying, you fucking moron. He had to be like, Krypton's destroyed. It happened in the first 10 minutes of the movie. You, we, we went over that. <laughs> Like this, these are the people making decisions. I was like, these are the people that are giving us the movies we are sitting through. Yeah. So keep that in mind when we see the trailer for a film like this, which isn't even, it doesn't even have a release date. It just says late coming soon. Like we're supposed it's, to be fucking it's, anticipated. It's later this year from my understanding. Yeah. God. Next up, it's, uh, the second trailer for Neil Blomkamp's Demonic, which comes out August 20th. Something new, something fresh, something that actually looks intriguing. You know, kind of a little like the Matrix meets Sinister kind of vibe here. Uh, looks looks neat. Yeah, like I said, everything I said on, I think it was, I think the, uh, the Conjuring episode I did with you and Austin uh, on that initial trailer still stands here. It you know, Blomkamp really was, a, to me, a very unique voice initially with sci-fi when he came out with District 9, Elysium. I know, I know, like, Chappie's, like, fucking 50-50 for a lot of people um, for understandable reasons. But, you know, even even with Chappie, like, he, he had a very unique take on the sci-fi genre that he wanted to do. And he was, to me, a very unique voice. So to see him, and he did have horror elements in those movies. So, again, just see him kind of say, like, let me put my unique voice since I'm not getting the fucking Alien 5 that he sure fucking got. Um, let me apply it to a full-on horror movie. Like, yeah, this trailer just enforced what I already thought initially. And, yeah, I'm very curious what Blomkamp wants to do with horror. Like, I'm really, really curious. And if it's good, Blomkamp, give me more. I know you're. I know he's been talking about District 10 for a while now, but if the mic's, like, good and is successful, I, I hope to see him do more horror movies. Well, I like that, you know, after Chappie kind of bombed and then he never got the Alien movie, he just kind of fell off the radar. Like, he wasn't really talking about anything. He wasn't doing anything. And then the demonic trailer drops, like, remember me, motherfuckers? And here we are with a movie that looks really cool and I'm very excited for. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't feel as bad about the Chappie incident because, I mean, he made that movie, so, like... Yeah. But no. In the case of Alien, I feel bad because it's like... The fact that the studio, like everything he talked about with Alien 5 sounds so fucking cool. And like the fact that the studio passed that up, a movie that would have brought back Sigourney Reaver that people fucking want to see in the role. Even Michael goddamn Bean back, who I think was like, at, you know, getting back into shape and getting off the drugs and everything. Like he was taking it serious. He was like, yeah, I want to do this. And they went, no, we'll do the Ridley Scott one that was a piss poor alien movie and just him trying to apologize for Prometheus the whole goddamn time. I feel like that was more Ridley Scott saying I'm taking back the reins. So bye-bye. I feel like that's what it, what, what happened. Yeah, that it really did feel Cause I think he was actually debating about doing another movie at the time. This guy was like on and off with another movie, but then God bless this young, fresh fucking face director. Right. Wants to touch his, alien franchise which he hasn't even touched since the first goddamn movie and he was he got all jealous and was like no i want to do it i'm doing it again. it's like well you haven't really prometheus is like so 50 50 on what you want to count it as so so like if you don't take away prometheus you haven't really fucking done an alien movie since the first one ridley I was like james cameron did the second one david fincher started doing the third one but then the studio finished it unfortunately um that's not a shot at Fincher for before anyone gets mad at me. I know he has his diehards. It's he was robbed of that movie. I'm gonna go ahead and just interject. Get mad, please. Just try. We don't fucking care. Yeah. 
Like, it's not a shot at him. He got robbed of that movie. Like, <laughs> and then I know this is a hot topic now, recent allegations. Uh, Reed and touched Alien Resurrection. So it's like, you haven't done it since the first film. So why, who cares if Blomkamp wants to do a fucking new Alien? You know, I just, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I just know that we're never getting this cool Alien 5. Hey, we're never getting it. Hopefully the show redeems. I know they're working actively on a show. So hopefully that redeems it. But, oh, God, what could have been. But, yeah, Demonic, hey, you know what, Bomb Camp? I hope this is the movie that tells the audience and all those studios that pass them up on that shit, hey, motherfuckers, I'm back, and I got a horror movie this time. <laughs> You can just suck this demonic dick, Hollywood. I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Chappie taught him how to be cool. I don't know. That movie, I fucking hated Chappie. That movie is so bad. <laughs> You're telling me you don't like Guy Ontward acting? Oh, my God. Well, I don't know why this guy decided to just put all of his eggs in the Guy Ontward basket. Uh, all right. Another time. We have a, you know... A podcast in the works that would be I think Chappie would be perfect for. Her. Oh God, yeah. Oh, we keep teasing that. I wonder if everyone's like, "What's it gonna be?" I hope they are. They probably fucking aren't, but I hope they are. A few like the diehards are like, "What is this new show they keep talking about?" <laughs> you think like that one week I was like, "Yeah, I got a lot of shit going on. That's why it's taking a while." They were like, "Oh my God, what's what's happening to Caleb?" It's like, "No, I'm just moving." That's if anyone's wondering, that's what I, I'm moving coast to coast. Very soon. Here's a little little nugget for you. Do you mean this show or the other show? <laughs> oh, yeah. Stir, st- st- yeah, stir that one around in your cauldron. I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just excited. Very excited, uh, too. Once the move's over and we, we do it, I'm very excited to talk about when we actually do it. Yeah, me too. Finally, the second trailer for Dune which sports an incredible cast and looks like it could either be an avatar level hit or a John Carter level bomb comes out October 22nd. There will be no middle ground with Dune. It's either going to be a huge hit or it's going to fall apart so fast. What if Jackass forever beats Dune at the box office? I wouldn't be surprised. I really, I wouldn't. (laughs) That would be hilarious. I love IMDB got bold. It's now called Dune part one. Oh, they got both. They're not going to wait like what it did and just wait until the end of the movie to call it It Chapter One. Like, you know, when they were like, let's see if it's successful. And then one else that, you know, it's only the first of the book. They're just <laughs> outright going Dune Part One. It's fucking, you're going to love this. Dune. Well, Villeneuve has not exactly been quiet about his plans to make this like a trilogy. <laughs> no, he hasn't. But it's also been taken for, I, I'm actually scared that this movie is going to bomb. Because I feel like there was hype on its initial announcement. Like, oh, shit, a new Dune movie? Like, rectify for those that hate the David Lynch one. Mm -hmm. You know? And, like, I feel like there was hype. And then, you know, COVID happened. The film got came delayed. It's now... It's the weirdest fucking release date for me. I don't... For the life of me, with all the horror films that have been locked in for October, why the fuck is Dune coming out? You got Last Night in Soho... You got Halloween Kills. You got Antlers, I believe. I know they haven't done a new trailer, but I believe it's locked in for October. Like, you have all these fucking horror films that are saying, we're going to take October because we got fucked last year. And then, you know, Jackass Forever, extremely inserted in there. (laughs) And the Wes Anderson film. And then Dune. Like, I just feel like there's no fucking hype anymore. And being at a weird release date that I don't think think it's going to do good. I don't think it looks bad. It actually looks, like, really good to me. But I don't think it's going to do hot. I didn't like that this new trailer revealed so many plot points. I didn't like that. This was like, like three minutes long. Yeah. It's, it's going to be like, how long is your movie for part one? <laughs> it's going to, it's going to clock nearly three hours, if not more so for sure. God, if so, I'm sorry, Dennis Villeneuve, HBO max. I'm not seeing your movie. at the. Theater. I know you made such a big deal, but HBO max in all the way. <laughs> Denis Villeneuve, Villeneuve, not Dennis. <laughs> Look here, Dennis. God damn it. <laughs> I Yeah, I, I've, his track Indeed. record for me has been kind of, you know, back and forth. I really liked Sicario. I didn't care for Arrival. And admittedly, I've not yet seen the new Blade Runner or Prisoners. So, you know. I like Prisoners. 
I like Blade Runner. I like to ride, but I don't like I did Sicario. Yeah. And Dune is such an ambitious story. It's, you know, a sci-fi epic that spans about 34,000 years. The whole book. Series. It's, yeah. Well, it's a sci-fi epic. And you mentioned, like, you know, Denis. I'm, I'm serious right now. Denis Villeneuve. Villeneuve. Okay. Uh, this. <laughs> Watch somehow randomly he listens to this and I just set him off. Like I checked my phone later, it was a fucking really angry tweet at me. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> Do you have any of the publicity that would get the show. <laughs> I'd be okay with it. I'd be like, all right, my bad. The fucking director of Dune hates your guts because you mispronounced his name. That's a headline right there. All right, then it just means I'm so now I'm just not even going to HBO Max. I'm just not watching your movie, bro. <laughs> but uh <laughs> You know, like, the thing is, too, like, he wants to do the sci-fi epic, right? If he knows a common link with his stuff, and I know once you... I know things we were talking about before this, you're going to end up watching all this shit. Yeah. Um, he d- his movies are very cold. They're very distant. Yes. How he... It's like every single film he does is very cold and distant. I think the one time he kind of dropped it was Blade Runner 2049. So unless he's willing to drop it, and even then, that was... The, the style of Blade Runner is very cold and distant. So unless he's willing to drop that, I feel like this is going to be the most un- inaccessible sci-fi fucking epic they're trying to do. And if that's the case, stop getting people like him and David Lynch to do your Dune movie and get a more mainstream director that will get some of the audiences will be more willing to go see. One thing that's always bothered me with sci-fi and fantasy is this. I don't like when you've got a mixture of like mystical, fantastical names and then regular names. Like, I think it's weird that the hero of Dune is a guy named Paul. <laughs> Game of Thrones had the same thing. Like, you know, you've got characters like, you know, Daenerys and Tyrion, and then you've got Jon. <laughs> like, either or. I hate this mixture. I, it bothers me so much. I, I didn't know this was a sticking point for you. It's so stupid. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. Like Hunger Games, they went full fucking weird name. Like, there's I don't think there's anybody in there that has a regular name. Like, I appreciated that. I didn't really care for it for the movie, but I appreciated it. You know, there's like I saw that there's a rumor swirling around that like Hunger Games, Harry Potter, and Twilight are looking at possible reincarnations. Essentially, ah, fuck that. That won't happen. I hope it doesn't happen. All three for various reasons. Well, Harry Potter is in the midst of a prequel franchise. That's not going to happen. Yeah, and then, Hunger Games happen. is probably gonna have a prequel movie coming soon because of the book that just came out, and then Twilight can go fuck itself. So, you know, there you go. Yeah, which I mean, I could go on day about how much I've been hating the Fantastic Beast movies, but yeah, whatever. Dune. Yeah, Dune. <laughs> wow. See, look right here. This tells you how much I'm just kind of like eh on Dune. <laughs> I just yeah, I know my like my dad. If you if you listen to this show a long time. Um, if you're a long-time listener, I don't, sorry, I'm burned out from this fucking terrible weekend. Um, <laughs> if you've listened to this show for a while, if you listened to our episode on the Snyder Cut of Justice League, then y'all met my dad, Tony Azagari, the biggest Dune fan in history. That guy's read all the books like six times. He's so excited for this. And I, I'm just not, I guess it's not genetic because I'm not. I'm just not. <laughs> I really think, unfortunately, you're only going to get the Dune fans to see this. Like, to actually rush to the theater. Everyone else, at most, will be an HBO Max look. Yep. You got the Dune fans and the poor schmoes like us who've got a podcast to cover. Yeah, and no offense, like, it's already looking like my bank account's going to be hurting in October with all the horror films I'm act- actively looking forward to. Like, yeah. all the ones I named earlier, in case anyone's running, I'm looking forward to all of them. So... And Jackass more than I am Dune. So I think Dune is going to, I think you'll benefit from a big screen, you know, experience with Dune. It's going to be that kind of movie, a very wide, you know, giant movie. So I'll probably see it at the movies. I don't know who the hell I'll go with because no one else I know wants to fucking see it. If I'm able to, I will against sport theaters, but that movie, it's October 22nd, correct? Mm -hmm. That's coincidentally like a peak of when I am supposed to be like moved so it may just because of personal things with that move it might be hard for me that weekend mm-hmm. to see it so it might just have to like be more so an HBO max out of necessity 
Well, there's a good fair chance that won't even be our primary that week. Uh, it'll probably go to the French Dispatch. And Austin will probably take that one because Wes Anderson is his, is his bag. That's fine. Like I said, that's literally like peak when I'm supposed to be like worrying about a lot of shit. So personal reasons, again, don't freak out moving. I may not be able to really be at theater that weekend. Much as I appreciate our fan base and doing the show, I highly doubt anybody's like really freaking out about that. I get letters in the middle somehow. Somehow they got my address. Are you going to be okay? I feel like you're floating away like a balloon and I'm grabbing your leg, pulling you back down to earth there, buddy. No, I like to think we have a good fan base, you know? I do too, but I see the numbers. (laughs) Anyone who keeps coming back, thank you very much. We need it. (laughs) Love you guys. So that's the trailers of the week. Uh, interesting bunch, a lot of stuff to come out. I always think, you know, the schedule's complete and then Hulu drops some shit like Vacation Friends and I'm like, oh, there's another one. <laughs> yeah, God, I come all day about the streamer show. Like, you just want a trailer the week before it comes out? Here you go. I'm like, stop doing that. <laughs> stop it. Give me some time to adjust to this shit. Jesus Christ. Um, so moving on. Marvel has selected indie director Bassam Tariq to helm their Blade reboot, which stars Mahershala Ali and has no current release date. Looking like the beginning of Phase 5, so I bet 24, 25. Uh, I looked up his career. He's a BAFTA nominee, uh, done a couple short films, a documentary, and one film prior. So he's a, a newcomer that they're kind of, you know, given a chance to. Marvel does that a lot. So mm-hmm. bring it on. Yeah, I'm down. I'm excited for this new take on Blade. Um, so any news right now is good news for Blade. Um, yeah, I got, I got a lot to say. I'm just excited for this new Blade movie. Marvel, you know, yeah, they do a good job getting fresh young directors with a, with a voice usually to do this. So they obviously saw something in those shorts in the documentary to pick him, you know, or at least to be courting him. I know he's not, he hasn't signed anything yet, but they are actively really trying to get him. So, between that and, you know, uh, our main character, actor, I'm not going to fuck up their name, so I'm just not going to say it. I can't name right now after this weekend. Uh, um, you know, being the one to code to Marvel about this Blade movie, like, so far, we really sounds like we got a really special film on our hands in the MCU, and I'm, I'm very excited for it. I want two things. I want Wesley Snipes to play Whistler. And I want the villain (coughs) to be Jared Leto's Morbius after a multiversal split. I was going to say Stephen (laughs) Dole. Oh, he can go fuck himself after what he said about Black Widow. Yeah, he's he's never coming. You think, like, you wonder if Mom was like, hey, should we maybe talk about giving him, like, a fun little cameo? And then he said that, and they went, never mind. Whereas Wesley Snipes is like, hey, I went to prison, and now I'm better. Yeah, well, and you heard that he's he's already spilled the beans that like he's talked to Marvel. He hasn't said what he's talking about, but he's talked to Marvel. So you, there's communication there between him and then the uh, MCU guys. So hopefully they get him, but it's like a cool little cameo that they're playing. Or yeah, he they're like, no, he's going to be our wrestler. Um, I'm sure they got something cooked up. If he's having like active talks with them, they got something cooked up with Snipes at least. Watch that conversation have absolutely fuck all to do with Blade. And he's playing like Mole Man or something in the Fantastic Four. <laughs> I'd be so pissed. <laughs> I'd have, I'd so kind of respect it. I'd respect it a little bit. No, I think, no, nope. Marvel's already learned their lesson with the whole manner and debacle that was Iron Man 3. I don't think they're going to do something like that to us again. Mm, I don't know. Well, I don't think so. Because look, they're actively fixing the whole Ten Rings thing. The upcoming Shang Chi, Shang Chi. How do we say it? I'm pretty sure it's Shang Chi, but I'm I might be wrong. <laughs> I've never heard I anybody think, else actually say it, so I'm just going they, with my. I don't, yeah, I don't think they say it in the trailer, so they don't. <laughs> God damn it! You know they got that. Like I said, Deadpool thing they confirmed Deadpool three is going to be rated R. And um, who knows? I yeah, I got faith that like if they're trying to wrestling science, it has to be blade related in some capacity. Well, yeah, probably. I just kind of, I don't hope it's not. I just I I think it would make it would make me laugh. I'd be more like amused than pissed off. <laughs> I 
I think uh-huh. I'm just an angry guy. I just get angry at the smallest. <laughs> Next up, Kevin Smith has announced that Clerks 3 is finally happening with the entire original cast of the first two movies, including Jason Mewes, Brian O'Halloran, Jeff Anderson, Rosario Dawson, and of course, Kevin Smith himself as Silent Bob. It's currently in pre-production. I am fucking psyched. I love Clerks 1 and 2. I'm I'm... I'm excited for this. I love the view askew averse. I think it's not a lot of people talk about Kevin Smith establishing his own cinematic universe years before anyone else did it. Or oh, no one talks about that or the whole like, you know, uh, universal movie monster universe of the thirties and forties. Uh, that was a thing. Um, I, this is actually, I don't know how I missed this. This is the first time I've heard this all week. So this is, you literally just told me news. I haven't heard all week. Um, and I am fucking, I'm officially excited. That really actually really made up for this shitty movie weekend. <laughs> yeah, everyone's really, coming back. Clerks 3 is going to be everybody. Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. I'm so excited. I know he's been talking about Clerks 3. He, I know he said it's to stay in a while because he's having to redo the script because the Clerks films are very personal for him. So it's been like, how do I make this one personal for me? So the fact that he finally figured it out, the cast is confirmed to be back. Like, oh, fuck yeah. Okay. Like, I lo- I'm like you. I love the first two. Uh, especially the second one, I quote second one a lot. I won't say one joke that actually always makes me laugh because I don't. I it's a racist joke, but it's really funny. Take it. I back. know exactly what you're talking. About. Yeah. Take it back. Yeah, yeah I know exactly. Yeah. What you're talking about. I can't say it, but it's it's really funny. <laughs> so <laughs> fucked up, but yeah. <laughs> where's Where's Casey or Stacy? Where, yeah, Stacy. Where's Stacy? I am Stacy. <laughs> Oh boy. Oof. <laughs> anyway, yeah. My favorite line is from the first the first clerks. And it's when uh Randall and Dante are just hanging out at the counter and some guy walks up to, to the cat and it's like, oh cute cat, what's his name? And Randall goes, Annoying customer. And the guy goes, fucking dickhead, and walks out. <laughs> it's so it's it's that's great. Randall is great, right? But he's back to play Randall. Fuck yes. Oh boy. What are they going to, you know, all the fucking Marvel jokes they're going to have. Yeah, I, I hope Smith is able to make this without any compromises. I know, obviously, the humor that he was able to pull off with the first two in today's society, people get, you know, a lot more uh, butt hurt. So I, I hope he's able to pull off the humor. So I, I wouldn't want the humor any other way in this series. We'll probably be talking about that a lot. Cancel culture will probably be a big topic in this movie. Uh, uh, next up, Leslie Grace has been cast as Barbara Gordon, a.k.a. Batgirl, in a new Batgirl movie headed for HBO Max sometime in 23. I will believe it when I see it, because they've been, they've been talking about a Batgirl movie for almost 10 years. <laughs> I, just, I don't buy it. I don't think this is going to happen. It never I, fucking I, happens. Well, they keep having issues. Like, what is it? The last issue they had was Whedon. Whedon was attached, and then all that shit came forth. And they were like, all right, dude, you're out of here. You know, obviously, the rest of Hollywood was like, you're done. You're not working in Hollywood anymore. So it's like, I think that was like the last big issue they had. And they seem to be moving pretty smoothly now. But yeah, it's like DC announces so much shit that it's like, until I see a trailer, I don't believe you, DC. Yeah, until I see like a production photo, it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, like, like Black Adam not- wasn't real until now. Yeah, it, we, they talked about it for how long, and then The Rock finally did the photo, and I was like, oh, okay, it's finally happening. Jesus. Granted, I'm still, to this day, don't understand how it's just not a part of fucking Shazam, but. I know, I'm wondering how, you know, is Batgirl going to involve Batman at all? And if so, what, which well, Batman? Again, DC's weird, because as you know, in the Arrowverse, either the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline to make the multiverse into just one thing, take away confusion. But now they've gone back without explaining it. They've gone back to multiverse on the TV side. The movie side wants to be connected, but then it wants to be a multiverse. So fucking confusing. And then they they have no idea. They sit there and wonder why MCU is just fucking destroying them constantly. I hope the Batman and Batgirl is played by Robert Pattinson's stunt double. And they never address it. They just act like it's Pattinson. But we all can fucking tell like it's not Pattinson, but they just act like it. Because that's, I mean, they already don't give a fuck about their fans already, so why not? God, think about a movie I'm dying to see. I just want to see the fucking Batman movie. God damn it. <laughs> Stop I'm, getting delayed. I want to see the Cyborg movie or the Green Lantern Corps movie. Like, that's, I, that, you know, 
now Green Lantern Corps is becoming a show on HBO Max. What about the Zatanna movie? Or that I, is dead in the water, I believe. Yeah, see what I mean? This just it's same you, with Cyborg. You get burned too many times, you stop putting your hand on the stove. I, that's I, why. I, that's why, like, I know you just don't even watch shows, but like, until I see stuff, then I go, okay, I guess I'll watch it. Now that it's finally fucking happening. Mm. Uh, speaking of something that is for sure happening, because Marvel doesn't fuck around like DC does, Michaela Cole has been cast in Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. And a lot of people think she might be playing the MCU's version of Storm, which would be pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> Makes sense for that character to come from Wakanda in this continuity. It would, and I'm going to naturally assume her accent will be better than Holly Berry's. <laughs> and actually stay on like it disappearing in like the second movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you know, I'm I'm very intrigued to see what they do with Black Panther 2. Uh, there, yeah. yeah, there's a loss. I mean, like it, the MCU is like I know like there are some people that have that MCU fatigue right now, and I'm personally I'm actually the most excited at like the possibility of what we're getting with MCU. I mean, those are groundwork that's getting laid out for Fantastic Four. There's a groundwork that's getting laid out for X-Men and now Blade, right? Blade and all this shit. So it's all this stuff that like we're getting the MCU treatment of stuff that in the case of, you know, Fantastic Four never had a good shot with Fox. In the case of X-Men, started out strong and then got really fucking spotty towards its later years. And then in the case of Blade, died with the third movie. And, and then obviously when Sticky Fingers played them in the show. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not letting anyone forget that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bringing that back. Uh, <laughs> so, like, you know, there's that going on. And then, like, obviously, Black Panther itself. Like, what you know, they've been very obviously quiet on what they're doing with this one. Um, and so there's a lot of, like, you know, obviously not just, like, that, like, ooh, Storm might be in this one. But what are they doing with Black Panther? Like, what is this new Black Panther going to be in the wake of Chadwick Boseman's um, untimely passing? I know that... At Comic Con, it was recently announced that Winston Duke is reprising his role as Mbaku, so he'll be back. Uh, I bet it's going to be, you know, some kind of battle for Wakanda's throne with a few interested parties trying to take over the country. I, that, that makes the mm -hmm. most sense to me, anyway. I don't know, but we'll see. I have yeah. faith that Marvel's going to deliver a a badass entry that's you know that honors Chadwick Boseman's uh, mm -hmm. Participation in this universe and also moves the story forward because Marvel's really yet to fuck up on a grand scale. Yeah. I mean, they've had some bad movies here and there, but overall, like the bigger stories never suffered. And I always have faith in them to give me something I'm going to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Like they don't confuse like my curiosity for like not believing. Like it's actually, it's a, it's a fun, it's a curiosity I haven't really felt since the early days in the MCU. Like it's like that kind of like, oh man, what are they going to do? This sounds exciting. And yeah, because I'm with you. Like it is sounding like it is going to be a, Battle for the Throne type film because they've confirmed that they're not recasting Black Panther. Yeah. They confirmed that they're not doing CGI of any sort to bring him back. And that what they have confirmed is that they will very much address his death. So I have to wonder if like they wrote his death into the movie. I bet, yeah. And that, yeah, it's gonna be a battle for the throne and and essentially the new mantle of Black Panther. Like obviously they know we're not stupid. Someone's gonna take the mantle because someone's gonna keep the Black Panther. Uh, character alive and going for years to come in the MCU. It's not just going to die with Wakanda forever. So it is shaping up to be that way. But again, they've been so secretive. Um, I'm actually kind of excited. And I'm one of the probably the people that like, well, I like Black, Black Panther. Black Panther. I wasn't in love like everyone else. Mainly because like, I think like towards the end of that movie, I thought it fell into like the traditional fucking third act spectacle that was kind of sharply contrasted with everything else the film was before that. Yeah. So, but I still enjoyed it, and I'm yeah, I'm I'm very curious on what they're going to do with that. And if yeah, if this lady's playing Storm, that's fucking exciting. I mean, that's exciting in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, that's not confirmed. You know, she all this confirmed is her casting, but fans are like, oh my god, maybe she's Storm. And you know, if that ends up being the case, if we finally get our first, you know, X Men in this universe, I'm going to lose my fucking mind. <laughs> yeah, you know, because you know what's going to happen. Like, they're going to get an X Men before we get the movie. So it's like, when is that going to happen, you know? I saw this cool thing on YouTube. Somebody took the uh, the MCU's, like, opening, you know, Marvel Studios logo, mm -hmm. but they put over it the 90s X-Men cartoon theme. 
so like that was like the x-men's opening music for like an mcu entry and i got fucking goosebumps <laughs> it was so cool it was done so well i'm like fuck if it's even a fraction of that exciting we're gonna lose our minds oh yeah I'm, i've already, already lost one when i heard they got when they got it back i was like oh my god Granted, it was terrified at how they did it. I'm terrified of Disney now with that, but. Don't play ball. <laughs> Disney buys your company. Don't play ball. We won't buy you and destroy and erase your company from existence. It is now our company. You are no longer Fox. <laughs> 20th century studios. Ouch. More like 20th century Disney studios. It's Dude, literally. It's the studio equivalent of a serial killer murdering someone and wearing their skin. It's the leather face of (laughs) studios. I just saw his family and Disney is using it to cut right through that red tape. (laughs) Oh boy. As long as you're sitting there terrified, like, yeah, let's just keep playing ball because I don't want to get bought by them either. Uh -uh. They, They just keep eating the chili, they know what's in it. But they're going to keep eating it because they don't want to be next. (laughs) Just shut up. I know it's fingers. Just eat it. (laughs) That's that's so disturbing. (laughs) Anyway, uh, speaking of horror, Jordan Peele announced his new horror film with a poster. The film is titled Nope, and it will star Daniel Kaluuya, Kiki Palmer, and Steven Yen. Comes out July 2022. And of course I'm on board. Uh, I'm intrigued as hell. Nope. Yep. Can we can we talk about his titles? Get out. Us. Nope. <laughs> Simple. Right to the point. Or kind of not to the point. Like, let's just kind of think about like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. I like. I'm curious. Like, I, I like. Jordan Pill has been a pretty fucking great voice in horror since his time off of Key and Pill. Um, I'm actually currently watching this show he produced, uh, Lovecraft Country. Um, Really solid show. Uh, sad that it so far, I'm like halfway through. I'm kind of sad we're not getting that second season, but I guess when your main actor leaves for MCU, that explains it. Uh, but yeah, like he's being very secretive, not again playing it close to the chest. And I'm curious, like the title, that poster. I'm on board. I'm curious on what this will be. I think this shit has 100% something to do with aliens. Drawn pill horror from with aliens. Ooh. I think, I mean, he's already conquered, you know, our, like some of our deepest fears, like, you know, identical twins and white people. So here we go. Aliens. I don't yeah. know. It'll probably be like aliens, but so his social commentary, which I'm fine with. Yeah. Maybe a disease kind of thing. I don't know. But as far as I'm concerned, he's one for two so far. I didn't really care for us. Oh, but, so he's two for two for me. So. Yeah, I'm excited for for Nope. Be fun <laughs> conquering that one on this podcast a year from now. Nope. <laughs> what a title. Uh, yeah, great title. I'm intrigued as hell. Uh, and finally, uh, ending on a sad note, because that's what we do here. Iconic New York comedian Jackie Mason has died at 93 years old. Um, he won an Emmy for voicing Rabbi Kristofsky in The Simpsons. He played uh, Krusty's dad. And he won another Emmy for his 1988 Broadway show special, Jackie Mason, The World According to Me. He was one of those, you know, classic, like kind of raunchy, Lenny Bruce type comedians uh, who uh, passed 93. He lived a life. That's sad. Condolences to his, uh, to his family. I know the name Jackie Mason. I just have no fucking idea where I heard it. <coughs> I feel bad when we do this and like, I don't know the actor. I'm just like, I got nothing. I... I, I like to, you know, I'm not doing a eulogy here. I'm, you know, I'm just paying respects. Yeah, it's just like I feel bad because it's not like like if you were to. It's like when you text me about like Russ Craven, or to say we'll never forget that text, and like I got visibly, yeah, bacon, and I, I'm gonna go to my room so that I can have to explain why the fuck I'm crying. And well, just a couple weeks ago with Richard Donner, you know, somebody who really touched our touched our lives. And I regret, you know, I, I appreciate Jackie Mason. I just don't really, I'm not familiar with his work or who he is as a person. So I want to, you know, mention him, but I, I got, I don't really have much else to say. Yeah. No, I, no, it's good that we at least mention them because 
obviously, as we learned with like in the case of like Richard Donner, right? Like with a big name like that, that was like you said it was like what third page fucking news. Like, how is someone with that influential? So if he someone that influential and that big of a name, it's that kind of news, you know, this poor guy got nothing. Yeah, it's a damn shame. But you know what? He's here. Is I mean, it's not the best, you know, epitaph, but we did what we could. To our thousands of fans. Again, yeah, here I am assuming in my head. Our millions of loyal followers, our legions. Yeah, they know his name now. His name is Robert Paulson. <laughs> Dream big and big things will happen. <laughs> uh, so before we get into old, let's talk about our other two films. Um, there was no bright spot this week. So if you're looking for it, you're, you're listening to the wrong episode. Clearly, the last good thing we said was Jordan Pill's note from here on out. <laughs> so now we've got uh, Jolt, and, uh, Prime Video's latest attempt to, well, I don't really know what they're fucking doing because all their movies seem to just fizzle out. There's there's no staying power in anything they've ever dropped. Ooh, <laughs> I don't get it. Other than the Tomorrow War, I never see these on social media feeds like, at least, like, with Netflix, right? Like, when first year was releasing, it was on my social media feeds. I was seeing it fucking everywhere for three weeks. Nothing with these Prime movies, especially Joel. There was nothing. I could have told people, like, oh, yeah, I saw Joel. They'd be like, what are you fucking talking about? Yeah. And Jolt ultimately is a story about a woman who is very angry. That's it. <laughs> that's that's the movie. There's not much else to it. There are. Oh, I was... I, I remember I started this morning after... Really working hard making dinner. I'm not a cook, so I wasn't really working hard. I just kind of put some stuff together and caught it dinner. Um, I, get it. I get it. Believe me. Yeah. And I'm eating, and I'm like, all right, let me start this movie because I need to fucking get through these three movies. And I just sat there so disinterested. I I think the only positive I gave it was like Kate Beckinsale. I, I tend to like her in action stuff because I think she usually does a good job. But Besides her, there was like nothing, nothing else I left on to in this. I, I just, uh, I don't know. I, I keep hoping for more. I'm too optimistic with this shit. I keep thinking like, I'm going to find something. This is going to be the one. Yeah. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to enjoy this. And most of the time, you know, that optimism kicks me right in the nuts. And then I'm left just kind of like, oh, God damn it. I thought this was going to be a huge ripoff of Crank. The trailer made it look like it was going to be that kind of thing. But really, it's just about a, a woman who is so angry. She has to have like experimental electroshock therapy at all times or else she's going to murder everybody in the, in the immediate vicinity. That That's it? Like, really? And even then, like when she doesn't have the vest, nothing really changes? I mean, that's because she got that that dick that just grows. Because apparently the writer never heard of the two different types of penises. And for those who don't know, there are two types. One's called grower, one's called shower. I think by the title, you should know which one is which and what that means. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, quite a significant part of the movie for some reason. I, you know, I who, who the fuck wrote this? I, I literally, dude, when they get to that scene, I was just sitting there, I was like, you know, as a grown man that's had a few sexual experiences, this has never been a topic of conversation was, you know, my, my penis later, like, like, why is this a, why is this a thing in the movie that we're harp, like harping on this so much, especially Kate Beckinsale, I'm like, come on, come on, Kate Beckinsale. It, it felt so forced that it literally, it felt like the screenwriter was like, I am going to write a scene so Kate Beckinsale has to talk about Dick for a few minutes. That's what this felt like. Like yeah, It has it, no relevance to the story. Oh, this is it. This is the only thing this dude's ever written. Scott Washa. This is it. And I hope this stays it. Dear God. Back in the day, the video scores, right? would like guys would sit there and to get your their shitty films rented they slap a cool they josh talked all the time everyone who knows any of these guys right put a cool cover on it put it on the shelf now you know sometimes you find a hand gym in there and it, it happened quite a bit you find a hand gym that turned out actually a fun time or a so bad it's good type of thing right but for the most part most of that was a lot of shit films 
Now the video stores are unfortunately dead, and we now have streamers. So now it just seems like what they've done instead, because they're like, well, we can't do cool covers because you got the stupid little ever-changing box thing that changes, right? Yeah. They're like, we'll do this. We'll get really good actors and just cobble some movie together and put it out, and it's going to be shit. But God damn it, we got Kate Beckinsale, Stanley Tucci, Laverne Cox, and um, Bobby, I don't know how to say his name, last name. Cannavale. Cannavale. You, you get all this talent. You're not, you're telling me you're not interested in this fucking movie? Come on. Well, I just hate watching, you know, bad movies happen to good actors. And I feel like that happens a lot these days. Uh, even like David Bradley, like why cast somebody like David Bradley, a great English character actor, to just use him for one scene where he talks about lobster being cockroaches? Like, the fuck? Also, David Bradley is Kate Beckinsale's godfather. I found that out. It, it, it's, it, that's okay. Uh, that, it's like I said, it's like instead of covers, they're like, we can't do covers anymore because streamers are different. So we just get it loaded with actors. Netflix does it. They always pop out these movies with a fucking loaded cast. And then the movie's not that great. Hulu does it. And then the movie's not that great. Like, that's instead of covers, it's actors. Like, we got to get good actors, even though this film is shit. Well, why did this film have to go to like the CIA and then like a, a shitty sequel bait that nobody's going to care about with Susan Sarandon? I mean, this, there's no point to this movie. I mean, we see our hero throw babies at a cop. It's just, it's fucking well, stupid. Like, there's no point. Like, it it has, like, plot developments that are happening out of fucking nowhere. Like, Bobby can... can the detective dude. God damn it. The detective guy randomly hitting on Kate Beckinsale with no lead up. He just so starts doing it. And then at the end of the movie, she's interested in him. And I'm like... The fuck did this come from there's like there's characters that just like the whole jai courtney thing made no fucking sense i was like none of this is clicking i don't give a shit <laughs> yeah it's i i don't understand it uh it's convoluted it took two of the things i hate the most about mo about modern filmmaking it took the whole you know women can kick ass to trope and combined it with fucking nonsensical political espionage thriller and just made this nightmare of a piece of shit that I just am never going to even think about again. Yeah. Oh, God. The only reason I'm thinking about it now is because we're talking about, talking about it. But God, I can't wait to not think about it ever again. Yeah. Probably, you know, a six because I'm being generous these days. You're being very generous. I gave it a four. Yeah, let let just spoiler alert for the fans. Like Connor's gonna be very generous compared to me. <laughs> I don't know. Call me Santa Claus because I like giving. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and just like that, jolt gone from our minds because we're talking snake eyes now. Oh God. Oh, so, good. <laughs> GI Joe, a very like loyal fan base great run as an 80s cartoon and can't seem to quite get off the ground as a film. I don't really know why. And knowing is half the battle. The, I had, I had to. I, hate you. <laughs> I don't understand. Cause like the God damn it. I don't understand because the materials there, there are comics. There's the 80s cartoon. The, the toys, if you really want to reach those goddamn toys, like the material is there. So why can you not translate this to a fucking movie? This should be a surefire fucking like we have a movie that people don't like, and it's gonna be hit, and we got a movie franchise. Don't know why it's so difficult. Yeah. The only people who can seem to make it work is Seth Green on Robot Chicken. G.I. Mm -hmm. Joe works there consistently. I, you know, Hail Nobra. But for some reason on film, this can't work. Three times. That's three strikes. And this is just Snake Eyes was so fucking lazy. Like one of the laziest movies I've ever seen. Just it, uh, stealing I think from it, every ninja movie ever, including fucking Kung Fu Panda a couple times. But keep going. So I think like I am looking it up, but I'm pretty sure like they won't be doing this again for a while. Yeah, this bomb bad. I'm looking at a 17.4 million box office, and their the budget is ranged from 88 to 110 million. Oh, Jesus! I felt that. 
but yeah, oh, dude, don't even like. So this is a martial arts film, ultimately, right? Mm-hmm. Synchronized martial arts, hand in hand. This was we are living in a post raid, post John Wick ward, and this was some of the shittiest, yeah, martial arts scenes I have seen. And they dragged one of the people from the raid. How dare you, Snake Eyes? How fucking dare you? You, if you don't, if anyone doesn't know, I fucking love both raid movies. How dare you drag that man into this goddamn film? So, do you think it's odd to name yourself after the weird little dice gimmick that got your father killed? Yes. (laughs) Yes. I also think it's weird that like our Snake Eyes is talking and he is famously a mute character. I think it's crazy that Henry Golding really can't land an American accent. I I'm not, okay. I'm not crazy. I was like, dude, your accent. One hundred percent. He slipped so many times. Like there were so many times. I was like, that's not American. That's British. And at that point, I'm like, you know, you can just make him British. Like Snake Eyes is fine. Like really, you don't even need to talk. It's amazing. You could just not use your voice. And he'd be exactly true to the character. Holy shit. It really pissed me off that we got his costume for 12 seconds at the end of the movie. Yeah, for a sequel that no one wants because we didn't want based off the box office. We did not want this one. All the G.I. Joe shit seems so forced. It, like everything. The movie, the movie could not decide to me if it just want to be full on Snake Eyes origin story or just G.I. Joe or like it couldn't decide. It and it pissed me off because like the actors, I will not shit on the actors minus a little bit on Harry Golding because they they were bringing it like they were committed. I Samara Reaving, you could tell if she was like wanting to play Scarlet because she did great, but goddamn, they barely put her in the movie. It was like she was like, "Hey, I'm ready to act," and everyone else went, "Well, let's. We don't really want you in the movie that much." <laughs> and also, I have a massive crush on her, so how dare you? Do this to my woman. Oh my She's god. She's one of the greatest goddamn young actresses working, but whatever. Moving on. Leave I, me alone. I day to everything you just said. Anyway. Um, she did good. The movie did not do good with she, her. She was barely in it and she didn't do enough to make a mark as far as I'm concerned. No, she was trying though. The movie just did not put her in it all that much. Because again, they could not decide if they wanted to go full G.I. Joe at all. Why did it go with a magical rock angle? Why was there a magical stone that can create like has lightning? no payoff? Also, isn't it weird how our hero is a total turncoat traitor and never suffers any consequences for it? He, yeah, you took literally one of the most beloved, morally right people in the GI Joe canon, and then you made him morally ambiguous. Like, go fuck yourself. And then the guy who is like 100% loyal to his people is immediately shunned and thrown out for using the rock in a very reasonable situation. Yes. <laughs> it, uh, I know you, like, again, I thought the guy playing Storm Shadow did a great job. You could tell he did his research and he was trying to give us a good Storm Shadow. But yeah. dear God, was that some of the worst buildup of something like mo- the G.I. Joe fan base know is going to happen, which is they are brothers, but then they hate each other. And that was so half baked, so fucking half baked throughout the movie. And yeah, they gave the piss, most piss poor reason why. Like, he absolutely had to use that stone. Granted, he didn't kill his uncle, which that was a weird edit to me. Is that yeah. like a weird edit to you? Like, it yeah. looked like he died, but then, like, no, he's actually way off in the woods. <laughs> like, he, also, he, you know, he was exiled for not even killing him. Like, all he did was like burn up a hut. And he's immediately like, you will never leave, lead this clan. How dare you? And he, understandably, he's like, fuck all of you. Like, you're going to let him. And over there is Snake Eyes just standing there having betrayed everything these people stand for. <laughs> the fuck? Man, who, who even give a shit about G.I. Joe, but even I was like, this is <coughs> weird. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is odd. And then, like, all the sequel baiting at the end of this one, I'm like, what, so I can watch a narrow movie where you can't decide if it will be G.I. Joe or Snake Eyes? Like, no. God, no. Do not thank, thank you, America, for collectively agreeing to not give this movie that much money. They never even brought up the vow of silence. That never came up. And, yeah, I'm like, you know, I'm like, 
Of, and I, I remember when they first announced this, man, I was like, of all the characters, why Snake Eyes? Like, I get it. He's probably the most beloved of the, like, the G.I. Joe brand, like, the most well-known. But he doesn't talk. I like, don't know. I can no. I can name more more Cobras than I can Joes. Well, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, okay, yeah, Snake Eyes because he's like he's a known Joe, but he doesn't talk. And then the actor you got can't maintain an American accent. Why don't just let him be British? Would it matter? I don't. Yeah, I don't think it matters because honestly, like his backstory. If, when I looked it up, there's not a lot. He's kind of like um. Like the Joker, like there's not a lot of actual backstory on this character. So it's like you literally had a fucking blank canvas you could have used. And all you had to keep true was he doesn't talk. But somehow this is what you picked. This is what you chose. This was the script that you sat down and went, this is it. This is the moneymaker. I think what pissed me off the most is how they tried to make the Storm Shadow thing a big twist. Like... From the beginning, you're like, yeah, of course he's going to be fucking Storm Shadow. Yeah. And, he, you know, the whole, like, you're getting that look like a shadow before a storm. Like, oh, so, yeah, there was that weird, like, again, another oddly edited scene. Like, the way they did that scene was weird. Like, there was, like, a extreme close-up, and he said his line, and then they cut away, and I was like, what? I don't know. The action sequences were just edited so fucking poorly. None of it looked realistic in the slightest. I, I didn't feel there were any stakes like there, how how do you take a fucking character that's known for his martial arts acts and then give you some of the worst martial arts I've seen? And then, <laughs> and then for Scarlet to be like, hey, guy I've never met who has no military training and has very much proven he has no loyalty to anybody. Hey, you want a job? <laughs> yeah. And then this is the thing. So, you know, again, how we talked about like Joel's right, you know, pro women thing. Did you notice that, like, the females in this movie were severely just shoehorned? Like, again, I'm saying by it, like, it looked like Samara Reaving and I can't remember her name, but the lady that was playing um, the Baroness, both were trying to do something. Like, they were both trying on their end, but the movie was just like, I don't want you in this movie all that much. I've never, I'm not really, you know, I don't follow G.I. Joe. I never really watched the cartoon. So to tell me if this is, isn't weird, but it felt odd that the Baroness would immediately be like, oh, yeah, I'll team up with a G.I. Joe for like an hour. It was weird. Like, <laughs> and if I recall correctly in the cartoons, and the little again, this was an age cartoon, so way before my time. But what I remember correctly is like they never at any point teamed up. Any of them teamed up with the Joes. Because yeah, it was always much- them. It was always G.I. Joe versus Cobra. That was the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> So it was it was just weird. That's why I say like I I remember watching it thinking, you know, I would be down if this was a full on G.I. Joe movie and I gotta actually watch both these actresses do their parts. Because again, it looks like they're trying, but the movie was just like plot convenience, barely puts you in it, like fuck off. Well, we've shown like so three strikes. This is this is never gonna work as a film franchise. So why not turn it into a show? This would I work think, great as a TV series. Yeah, I, I think Anne Cormier Review, just do an era cartoon at this point. I was like, just try again with a cartoon. It seems to be the only thing. Oh, yeah, show. Because, I mean, you, my, really, honestly, my ask, Henry Golding, they had a really game cast. Like, the, you tell the cast was trying. It's, and Harry Golding was trying, but his accent just fucking kept slipping. But it's like, yeah, this movie did no one favors. I don't, I, I can't press enough. I don't blame the actors. I absolutely blame the movie. I blame the writing. I blame the direction, the fight choreography. All of that betrayed them. And they were probably just simply trying to make something work. Well, it didn't. <laughs> it did not. No, it failed miserably. I give it a six. And I don't really know why. I could go lower, but. Uh, yeah, you were generous on this one as well, and I also actually gave this as four as well. Wait. Well, I'm not happy with this weekend. With that, I again say hail Nobra, and I think this is a good place to to move on to our our big old steaming pile of movie for this week. Uh, old was written and directed by somehow Oscar nominated filmmaker M Night Shyamalan. 
who keeps reminding audiences that his deal with the devil appears to have expired after four films. He got The Sixth Sense, Unbreakable, Signs, and The Village, and that was it. We got a brief glimpse of talent again with Split, but here he is having squandered his third or fourth second chance. And I don't get how this guy keeps getting funding for films. After The Last Airbender, honestly, that should have been it. After Earth. That was, again, after fucking The Last Airbender, The Happening. <laughs> like, who keeps paying for this guy to make movies? He's, he hasn't had a good box office return in ages. I don't know. Well, unfortunately, I look, this was the most successful film this weekend, but I really think it's because people just had to witness how bad. Um, yeah. Um, I... I look, man. Yeah, like he has proven that apparently that good films are flukes for him, and <laughs> that's well the norm. Because you know, like everyone, like everyone else, I like Signs. I liked Unbreakable. I know that one actually didn't do too hot, but it's had a big appreciation years down the line. Um, I personally wasn't into Signs. If, if for anyone who's wondering, it's because the fucking twist with the water can go fuck off. Signs is one of the, our first movies that scared the absolute piss out of me. So it's got a special place in my heart. I will give you credit on that home video scene. That is a legitimately creepy part. And I understand that. But yeah, that twist just takes it away from me. I was seven. I was seven. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but like after that, you know, he had a string of bad films. I personally came back on board when The Visit because I was hearing about that in like the horror community. I was like, oh, dude, you should check out The Visit. It's really him like it's at least a return to form. Like he's clearly like, he's coming back. And I saw like, okay, like he's showing that he has that talents back in some capacity here. And I was on board with from then on. And I really like split. I personally liked glass. I I'm like you, the, the twist again, wasn't so bad that I hated it. Like with signs, but I also was like, okay, Shyamalan, this is weird. Um, and I was excited for it. I was really, I was like, you know what? You've been on a good streak. The trailer made it look good. I'm down for the concept. Awesome. And I sat through the movie and I went, holy fuck, all the bad came back in full force in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I don't understand. It is weird. You know, I, I was, I loved Split. I was like, he's back and this was a good movie and here we come. And then Glass was like, all right, so you can't quite stick the landing, but you know what? That's okay. You've only been working on this movie for almost 20 years. Uh, let's, let's give you one more chance. And old is it. I am done. This guy's, he's fucking dead to me. I can't do this anymore. I'm, M, M. Night, you're done. And it's not, it wouldn't, if it was just bad movies, it wouldn't bother me so much. It's the fucking ego. It's how much every movie is his masterpiece to him. I, I can't stand that shit. Yeah, I don't. I'm like, what masterpiece are you trying to make? Like, because God damn, dude, your movie, it's like on a, just a purely technical level. Like, what the fuck are you doing behind the camera with these movies? All I wanted to know was what is happening? What is causing this? And I didn't fucking get it. That is all oh, I cared dude, about. You, you stayed caring about that? Because as soon as like the, the movie kept going, I stopped caring and was just like, please. And just in my misery before I shoot myself in the theater. I was hoping that I would just get like an explanation that made sense. At least I was like, he's the twist guy. We're going to get the twist. We're going to find out what happened. I was thinking it's an alien zoo or it's, you know, I don't know. Poseidon is pissed that they littered in the fucking beach. I don't know something, <laughs> but no, we got pharmaceutical tests by a company we've never fucking heard of that we don't care about. I didn't care. I was like, and even then they don't even know fucking why this Island's doing this. Yeah. Literally like, well, we don't know why it's doing this. I'm like, I really hope the graphic novel this is based on has a much better explanation than what the fuck I just got. I feel like it couldn't be worse. Yeah. Okay. Sandcastle by Pierre Oscar Levy and Frederick Peters. That's the graphic novel that was turned into this piece of shit. Feel bad for them. Dude, I, I don't think I've ever had a more awkward theater experience. Like this was an awkward theater experience because throughout theater, you know how you can kind of gauge like the air? The air was everyone just sitting at the, staring at the screen thinking, when is this going in? And I watched so many people get up to go to the bathroom and sit back down. Usually you see people not try to do that. 
No one gave a shit. I saw it just cross through being like, oh, I guess it's time to get more for my soda. And then they leave and come back. And you can see people are just like, at some point, just rolling their heads. Like, I saw one dude constantly, like, adjusting. I was sitting there constantly just going, loud as I could. Like, no one in the theater could tell. But, again, Jackass fucking forever trailer played for two and a half minutes and laughed throughout all two and a half minutes. Even mm-hmm. after the trailer ended. I saw the film with my grandpa. Um, I saw last week's Pig also with him. He didn't care for either one. And um, he pointed out that all we've seen so far is old Pig. So I got to give him something. <laughs> but um, Which one did he hate more, old or Pig? Uh, honestly, he, we called old. I mean, he called Pig the worst movie he'd ever seen, which frankly, I thought was an exaggeration. And he didn't talk much about old, but knowing my grandpa probably hated old more, but uh, I can always gauge his response by the way he watches a movie. Cause I can hear him grumble. And when he's grumbling, I'm like, Oh, he's not enjoying this. And he's just sitting there like, mm-hmm. it's like little, you know, old guy noises. <laughs> and when I hear old guy noises, I'm like, Oh, he doesn't like this. <laughs> I don't think he knows about that. (laughs) Well, I do. Um, Let's talk about the cast of this thing, uh, who are probably the best thing about this movie. They're trying. But the words they're supposed to... Oh, before we get into it, I want to point this out. I pointed this out in my review, and it's something I only just realized about Shyamalan. I don't think he understands how people talk. No. And it's hard, you know, because it's to the point where it's hard for me to even say they're trying because it's some of the most awful delivery and stilted dialogue I've had to witness in a fucking big budget Hollywood movie. But I'm talking six cents to old. Every film he's ever done, the dialogue feels so inorganic, feels so forced. And I'm like, I just, I'm, I feel. Hi, I'm, I'm John. I'm a doctor. Okay, John. <laughs> yeah. Like I realized it with old, like I had this Kaiser Soze moment where I'm like connecting all of his other films. Like, holy shit. He's never had a natural conversation with anybody. <laughs> this is my wife, Jolene. She's a psychiatrist. All right. But like telling, you know, her, on the drive there, telling the kids like, you know, don't spoil the moment. Like, that's not a thing people say. Like, it's just, it's weird. I don't know what it is about this guy, but. Oh, it's, the movie is filled with things people would not say. Well, like when they're figuring out, like maybe it's some kind of time loop and it's like a half hour is one year of our lives. Like, how would you fucking put that together? How would you ever put that together? Yeah. I know. Oh, by the way, for our fans who are listening right now, how we're saying the, this dialogue right now is damn near exactly how it's said in the movie. Just so you know. Yeah. Like they never seem to have a moment of like, what the fuck? You know, they're always no. just like, okay, now this is happening. All right. Now we got to deal with this. Oh, our three-year-old is now a pregnant teenager okay i guess that's over now uh moving on like moving on I think a moment to be like the fuck is happening no i said the only one who ever showed like is spiking above like a to- regular talking voice is the asian who's constantly yelling everything he says did you notice that it put the shit on me he everything i'm going to go swim over there mm-hmm. could you not yell like i don't understand the loud voice they're all standing around you. Oh, and by the way, for any of you wondering who did see this movie, The Missouri Breaks, 1976. Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando. Is that, that the movie? That's the movie that the crazy doctor is constantly trying to remember. That it has nothing to do with the plot of this. Schizophrenia? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you if you if you obsess over a movie, you're schizophrenic. That's what I fucking learned from this goddamn movie. Well, and I need to be locked the fuck up because <laughs> I am obsessed about a lot of movies. <laughs> In fact, all four of us need to be locked the fuck up. <laughs> so we've got uh Gael Garcia Bernal as Guy, what a creative name. Uh, um, a father, because that's pretty much it. He's an accountant. What? Could one argue that's kind of racist because he's French and his name is Guy? Is he French? I, I want to say French. Guy Garcia, he's Mexican. 
Mexican? The actor's Mexican. I'm not, the character might be French, but the actor's Mexican. Oh. Well, so, that's, I've, I see that in so many like, French movies. Guy. I'm like, you guys can't get more inventive with your names for dudes over there. <laughs> well, he is known for his performances in such films as Rosewater, Y Tu Mama Tambien, The Motorcycle Diaries, and Coco. He also starred in the prime video series Mozart in the Jungle. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, just so I don't repeat myself, every single actor I'm just going to naturally assume does great things and other things, and they all suck here. So I'm just going to put that out right now. They all well, suck here. They probably do better in other things. Yeah, you're not wrong. Covered my base. Don't have to keep repeating myself. I feel like, who was I talking about? Yeah, uh, Tarantino, I recently said, tends to bring out the best in his performers. I think I was talking, where, where did that come from? One of our episodes uh, on one of our shows. But I realized M. Night has the opposite effect. He tends to bring out the absolute worst in almost everybody he works with. Yeah. Even, uh, what is it, Alex Wolf, who is a rising star, in my opinion, doesn't do a lot of good in this one. <laughs> The only people he's ever managed to really like bring out something special is Bruce Willis and James McAvoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he didn't do good with them. No, I don't know. Well, let's swing away. Um, Vicky Creeps, Cripes, Cripes plays Pris- Prisca. Was it Prisca? Prisca? Prisca. Prisca. I'm actually kept saying Frisca. I think Fresca, but when I, because you know. Shanghai doesn't know how to fucking name human beings either. I fucking thought it was Fresca for about half the movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, God, just fucking names in this movie. We'll get to one. You know what I'm talking about. She's a mom with a tumor and he's going to leave her. I don't like this character because they try to like excuse infidelity with like, I'm dying, which is not a great character choice. It's. I don't know why they're trying to make her like sympathetic. I'm like, she's a horrendous human being. It's like her husband wasn't cheating, was more willing to support, and she ran away in the arms of some. I'm assuming young lover, younger lover, and usually how it happens. Yeah. Um, all because she has a tumor that, based off this movie, shouldn't be a big deal because all she had to do was get it removed, and they have the money. So I don't it was, understand. It was incredibly operable. Like they literally carved carved out a watermelon on the beach, like it wasn't even attached to anything. It was just a tumor. Yeah. I don't think M Night knows how cancer works. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was like, so this was one of those tumors that didn't we call call for her to cheat and turn away from her husband? Because literally, again, based off from the looks of it, they had money. They could have gone to a doctor and got it removed very early on before it would ever got into a cantaloupe-sized thing. And he seems like a good guy. <laughs> yeah, they, he's not portrayed as a dick. He seems to be a good father, good husband. Like, I did. I did. God damn it. Shame on. God damn it. Uh, Creeps has also appeared in such films as Phantom Thread, The Girl in the Spider's Web, and Colonia, which was pretty good. You ever see Colonia? I haven't seen any of the three movies you just named. So just to cover my bases once more. <laughs> Phantom Thread is really good. It was Daniel Day Lewis's final performance before his retirement. That one I've been wanting to watch. I haven't wanted to watch. And then uh, Colonia is a uh, dramatized, like a dramatization of true events that happened in South America. Emma Watson and Daniel Bruhl. Uh, Daniel Bruhl is kidnapped by a new regime and thrown into like a religious work camp that's like crazy cult compound and Emma Watson breaks in to try to save him. Uh, Michael Nickvist, uh, Vigo from John Wick. He's the bad guy. He's the crazy oh. cult leader. Okay. Oh shit. Crazy cult. God, he plays a great bad guy. He really fucking does. That movie was, I was expecting that to suck and I was drawn in. It was like, shit, this is creepy. You know, cre- cults creep me out. Oh yeah. Those are creepy. Cults are just inherently fucking creepy, man. Oh yeah. Um, Rufus Sewell plays Charles, a psychotic doctor, and he is constantly reminding you of it. Sewell has appeared in such films as Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, The Illusionist, A Knight's Tale, The Father, and The Legend of Zorro. 
Count Armand. I've given that movie so many fucking chances. <laughs> he's a he's a that guy for me. I, I recognize the name. Mm-hmm. I recognize him when I see him, and I'm like, hey, that was that guy. Yep. He's actually probably one of the few people that seem to be trying to actually elicit a good performance. I don't know. His character was kind of an asshole from the beginning, where he's just like, you know, like your kids look fine to me. Stop talking to me. <laughs> yeah, your kids look fine. My wife's hot. I have the most glaringly obvious form of violent schizophrenia I've witnessed. Not subtle at all. Uh, Abby Lee plays Crystal. Charles is a vain wife with a calcium deficiency that she informs everybody about. Uh, I know whenever I go anywhere, I am constantly telling everybody what my physical ailments are. I don't know about you. I, yeah, you know, I... God, I do it all the time because you know we don't live in a world where there's pills if you have calcium deficiency. It, and I, take. There's a bubble. Uh, well, that Abby Lee has appeared in such films as The Dark Tower, The Neon Demon, and Mad Max Fury Road, and she's also a frequent player in the HBO series Lovecraft Country. So she's a. And that's why I say good performances, right? Uh, she's really good in Left Our Country. I really like her character. She plays a uh, this like mysterious woman that may or may not be good, bad. Like we don't really know her true motives, and she like does a really good job. I really like her in it. There's a actually a twist. I won't ruin it in case you ever get around to watching it. Um, there was like a twist halfway through that I just watched a couple nights ago that made me go, "Oh shit!" But she's really good in that. Um, I forgot she was in uh, Mad Max for Road. She was one, she was uh, one of the more she had, she was one of the girls that had more lines than the other ones, I believe. <laughs> Memorable, clearly. <laughs> yeah. Well, no offense. Like they got a lot of big names for those females, but most of them didn't say more than like maybe what a page worth of dialogue. <laughs> I did want to tell you before we started recording, but you know, fuck it. I did start watching what we do in the shadows. And uh, I'm three in, and it's fucking hilarious. I'm going to keep going. Oh, gee. What, after what we're doing in the shadows, Holliston. It's going to be a great fucking two for for you. I tried to watch Holliston. I, I couldn't I couldn't get into it. I don't care for... I don't like laugh tracks. And it was... That's part I, I, of the joke. It was so stupid. I couldn't... I, I just That's wasn't part sold. Of the joke, though. God. I, I'm sorry. You got you got me into one. Enjoy the... It, take the win. Take the W. I want I want the two W's. <laughs> Alex Wolf plays teenage Trent. We talked about Wolf last week with Pig, and you know he's the kid from Hereditary in the new Jumanji movies. Uh, definitely, you see it a rising star. Um, plays a you know a kid who becomes an adult way too fast. I thought pretty well. Yeah, he he was probably one of the few. Again, I'm not gonna say he was great compared to some of his other roles, but you tell that like he was giving it his all. Crest divorce scene involving pregnancy aside, which we'll get to in a goddamn minute. Because why the fuck? That his whole character is problematic. You have someone that has a mind of a six-year-old that's a teenager doing the weirdest shit throughout the movie. And you're just like, maybe you should have had them mentally age as well, Channel Because this is just getting fucking weird. Because I feel like, you know, if even if you're mentally six and you suddenly become like 16. You're, you're still six. That's still who you are. Physically, you know, I feel like a lot of, you know, those emotions and ailments that comes from the brain, which isn't going to be developed enough to be feeling this shit yet. Yeah, I was like, I don't think it... it very, he tries, but God damn, that character is problematic. Yes. Um, Thomas and McKenzie plays the teenage Maddox. Names Mackenzie appeared in such films as The King, The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies, and Jojo Rabbit. She's set to appear in Last Night in Soho later this year. And uh, again, not bad. Yeah, you can again that she's another case of like a rising star, like she's getting a lot of big names. I actually forgot she was in Last Night in Soho. She's uh, the main character opposite um, Anya Taylor Joy, correct? Yeah. I believe. I thought, I thought she was great in Jojo Rabbit. She's the uh, the Jewish girl hiding in the in the attic. That was her. Oh yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah. So see again, what 
why are these people getting attracted to the script? You have good actors. What is happening? I think a lot of these young people, they're like, you know, almost, I want to work with M. Night Shyamalan. He's an established filmmaker. Even if his films are shit, he is one of the most recognizable names in Hollywood. So, you know, take a chance. Hugh, I, for, I, I almost forgot to mention this, by the way. Hugh believes he's been working in Hollywood for three decades. Connor, do you want to do the math on when Sixth Sense came out? 1999. It's 2021. Do the math. I verified on my phone before we recorded to make sure I'm correct. <laughs> Buddy boy. Yeah, yeah. But just a, two years over two decades, Shamalon. So that should have been the sign, all right? If the guy can't get his own fucking tenure in film correct... How oh, do I expect him to do a good movie? You know what I want to see? I'm I, I want, I'm tired of this super confident, like, I made so many great movies, Shyamalan. I want to see, like, a disheveled, you know, sweating, like, you know, tie kind of loose M. Night Shyamalan who's like, thanks for coming. I'm, I'm really trying here, folks. I, I need a win. Please help me find this I, win. I tried really hard to make this. Just please like it. <laughs> I want a young exec, like a young senior exec, you know? To just be like, get ready for me one day, right? Someone like us that has grown up with this shit, and they're like, hey, man, so we got I got a movie script coming your way. It's from M. Night Shyamalan. Like, you got to read it. And he, instead of going, oh, he goes, oh, fuck. And he, he reads it. He's like, you know what? Bring him in. Shyamalan thinks he's going to get this. He's like, oh, I got this one. Hope this young guy get his start as a producer. And he goes, he looks at him and just rips his script up in front of his fucking face and goes, hey, Try again, you fucking hack, and actually give me a fucking good movie. Good day. Because at this point, Shyamalan needs a fucking reality check from someone. He tell, they tell him, like, put him in the cage with the others. They put him in a room with, like, you, Bowl and Joss Whedon, and they're like, help us. And he's like, no. And that's the last we ever see of M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> oh, I am really tired of hearing about him. I'm at a point where it's like, I don't, I don't care who I offend, who Shyamalan fans get mad. Like, no, stop giving these directors passes. Like they need to get reality check of like, you need to know how to make a good fucking movie. Ken Wong plays Jaren, the nurse who is constantly saying, I'm Jaren. I'm a nurse. No, he doesn't say it. It's more like I'm Jaren, the nurse aggressively loud uh he's played major roles in shows such as lost in humans the night shift and the sopranos and just one episode but it was a good performance uh and he's also appeared in such films as red dragon x-men the last stand squid and the whale and star wars the force awakens and no i don't know why my voice has suddenly taken on an npr quality maybe i'm just very tired uh, <laughs> you want to record late this is on you I got work early. And I there's had two, There's two carriers on my fucking base now. <laughs> I, I All day it was Olympics and then Pulp Fiction, and then I had to shove Jolt into my evening, and here we are. <laughs> uh, you, chose the Olympics, so hmm? you chose the Olympics, sir, right? I chose not to watch the damn Olympics. France beat us in basketball. I'm, I'm offended. I thought you're not a sports person. Why do you watch the Olympics? Because this is, it's because I'm at my family's house and it's the only thing on. Okay, there. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you're not a sports person. What's going on here? You get you get drawn in. I don't know. It's you know, it's America versus the rest of the of the world. You get drawn in a little bit. I, I'm the same way with the World Cup. I don't know. <laughs> um. Nikki Amuka Bird plays Patricia, Jaren's epileptic, epileptic wife. Uh, she's appeared in such films as Jupiter Ascending, The Personal History of David Copperfield, The Laundromat, and the 2006 remake of The Omen. And uh, I don't know, it's just, it's weird how everyone is constantly like pointing out their medical issues like it's going to come up later in the movie. It's just an odd thing that nobody would ever do. 
No, because no one in this. I'm determined that Shyamalan does not create humans. He creates robots that think they are human. They're like the prototype Terminator. They're trying to figure out how to be human to infiltrate us. I'm convinced he's never had a natural conversation with anybody in his life. Everyone talks to him because he's M. Night Shyamalan. Nobody, nobody ever actually wants to talk with him. You know what I mean? So he doesn't know how people talk. You know, he has kids, right? Does he? Or are they just like, you know, werewolves from the future or some dumb shit? <laughs> he was dead the whole time. <sighs> what a twist. I've been rewatching Robot Chicken. That's why all this shit is fresh in my head. <laughs> um, finally, Eliza Scanlon plays teenage Kara, uh, Kara, Kara, Charles and Crystal's daughter. Scanlon has appeared in such films as Little Women, The Devil All the Time, and the miniseries Sharp Objects. And her whole character is a fucking mess. <laughs> oh my God. Just getting, you know inexplicable pregnancy climbing up the mountain and then just falling and instead of like so one of them trying to catch her they just run <laughs> yeah i there was no attempt to catch like maybe if we catch her we can keep her alive no she just falls down and dies they actively it's like fucking monty python they're just like run away and then she just falls to her death yeah and a scene that like i can't you can like and this is a I, it's something no one really talks about but like shamlon is he like just stuck on PG 13? Because he does things in movies where you can tell he wants to do an R rated moment, but then he's like, no, I have to do PG 13. I'm like, just give, if you're going to go all the way, man, just give it to me all the way. Like, show me her fucking splatter. Show me the fucking thing get removed. Wasn't split rated R? No, it was PG 13. God damn it. He literally has never done. A PG-13 film, and he sucks at using the one F word, because I think he did it here, and it was like the most forgettable moment. Oh, it's embarrassing. I'm looking that up. Uh, is he really never done a, an R-rated film? Yeah, it was PG-13. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. That's... Oh. Oh. Damn it. He... It's, yeah, like The whole surgery scene would have had more punch if this had been rated R. The pregnancy, the birth would have had more punch. Just look, just like I told you about that band and Tilla, they only sings about the same goddamn thing, and they're a joke in the metal community. You got Shamalon who just keeps doing the same goddamn thing, doesn't want to change, and is becoming the biggest Hollywood joke known to man that somehow still gets movies. I it it's so weird that he does like there is no uh there's no repercussions for all this. Every film he's ever had, he gets another chance every fucking time. I don't understand it. There's certain directors out there who can't fail. B, there's, I don't, I don't get it. Like, how does this guy, like, who, does he have dirt on people in Hollywood that haven't got caught for anything yet, maybe? That would explain a lot. <laughs> hmm, I don't know, maybe. Old has an IMDb score of 6.1, Rotten Tomato score of 51%. It's grossed about 23 million on a budget of 18 million, so it's already past its budget. Uh, critics are condemning its uneven tone and inconsistent screenplay, but they are praising the cinematography. Uh, I don't six, I, <laughs> six point. Who gave it that high? But God damn it, America. <laughs> America. Um, well, it's nice to be out of Philly for a change. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, you know, casting himself as the, the van driver, giving himself such a big role. He does that all the fucking time. It used to you know? just be a quick cameo, which was fine. Directors can do that. But now it's like he was an active part of this one. I'm just like. <sighs> the turning point was Lady in the Water when he cast himself as the writer who's going to change the world. Oh, fuck, I forgot about that. Yeah. The ego. It's the, that's what pisses me off more than anything. It's the ego. It's the I'm creating art that's going to last forever mindset. Yeah. We well, you know, I don't know, at the AMC, right? And actually, this is for both movies. Harry and Golding did a nice little thing right before Snake Eye started at the yep. AMC I went to. Me too. Yep. Okay. And then Shailon did a thing for old. And I'm like, should this be a sign? Like, if you're going to promote your film literally the minute before it starts that your film's going to suck and you're just grateful that people paid money to go see it? <laughs> 
yeah, it's like, hey, thanks for showing up. You know, if it sucks, too bad. We already got your money. Yeah. <laughs> Except like, like there was a difference. Like Henry Golding was like, you know, we tried really hard. And again, I, I believe in the actors that they did. It's just everything around them did not try. Um, but then in the case of like Shyamalan, yeah, it's like you were saying, he's like, you know, I really believe in the cinematic experience. They, was, they got everything in theaters, so here's my new movie. And I'm like, your movie could have gone straight to fucking Hulu, dude. It was more like, I, I'm so happy to be here to give you genuine thrillers again. It was like, aren't you happy that you get to be here with me and my movie? Aren't you so happy and proud of me? Like, just, God. If it was split, Yes. If you gave me another split, yes, I would have been so happy. Been like, God, yep, it's on that money tree. But no, you gave me the fucking happening again, you son of a bitch. What? No. <laughs> God. Yeah, it's old is weird. Um, So th- the coral, what was the significance? don't know like why was it that that's the way like that's when all of a sudden this mystical mumbo jumbo that's never explained just ceases the core is its kryptonite it doesn't function and what is it i kind of want to just get the graphic novel just so i can find out like is there an explanation on what this place is probably because i read from somewhere someone online before the movie came out they were like dude if he follows the twist in his movie from the graphic novel, it's going to be fucking insane. And mm. I doubt what that guy was promoting was anything I saw in the movie. All right, I, that settles I, it. I, I got a feeling that he was promoting a really cool fucking out there twist in the graphic novel that got completely changed in the movie. Should we find out what that twist is right now, or should we should we buy the graphic novel? I kind of want to buy the I kind of want to buy the graphic novel, honestly. Okay, I'll, I'll look it up when we're done here because I don't I don't want to shell it out. Just, you know I bought what? my own cool graphic novel today. Let's look it up, but not let's after record. I don't want to for people that actually the few fans we realistically the few fans we have that probably want to read the graphic novel. Like I don't, I don't want to do it to them. I got I, you guys. Yeah. Okay. Good for them. Um. Because yeah, are we not going to talk about midsize sedan, midsize SUV, big ass mm-hmm. truck? H3 miles to the gallon, like whatever his fucking rap name he wanted to be. How do you ca- make a rapper character and name him uh, Midsize Sedan? How do you make a gangsta rapper character? Because they reference that he does do that kind of rap. And his <laughs> name is Midsize, you know, H2 to the nine. I don't know. I won't keep well, making I mean, a name for him. To be fair, I mean, look at some rap names. You know, look at like what too short like yeah but it's not like fucking the baby it's not cheesy puffs you know <laughs> mid size man not double stuffed oreo that's not a bad rap name honestly like a big, like a big fat guy <laughs> double stuffed oreo I, I i listen to that guy <laughs> this size sedan Oh God! And what a terrible character! Like he's just sitting there. The chick washes up on the beach because, of course, he's not human. It's a Shyamalan movie, so he doesn't ever react to her being gone. And then he doesn't say anything to them when they meet, get on the beach. He's not like you know, hey, there's something wrong here. He's just like doesn't say anything. And <sighs> he just stares Abby Lee down, who. Like, her character is literally just there to look pretty. Like, the amount of time, like, she spends the whole movie in a bathing suit showing off her body. I mean, it was like, this movie's not doing any favors. Like, Lovecraft Country, where you're actually acting, you're just literally a object in this entire fucking movie. I'll give it that the scene towards the end where she's, like, her calcium deficiency catches up with her and she's, like, you know, her bones are all fucked up. That was kind of creepy. That was the one scene that myself and the audience actually reacted to. Literally the one scene. And you could hear people in theater going, oh, oh, like <laughs> really loud. Because, yeah, like he didn't cut away for a long time. You were watching it happen. Even I was like, oh, my God. But then it just made me mad. The other thing was like, why couldn't this one scene be the entire fucking movie, you asshole? I was like, you had a great scene here. 
could it have not just been like a great movie to go with it? The biggest part that irritated me was the end when they, spoiler alert, go through the coral and escape as like 50 year old, six year olds. And they give the notebook to the cop and the cop immediately is like, oh, let me look into this. And like starts making phone calls and like they all get arrested. Are you kidding me? There's no way to prove anything. Anything happened. I mean, they got to prove that not only are they six years old, but everyone on that island like aged to death. No, this will never I hold know. up in court. <laughs> you know how you prove it? You keep sending people there that can't escape. So it's like you're not proving anything. You just want to send people to the fucking death. Like, and there's no reason they can't accomplish. You know, the, med- the pharmaceutical company can't accomplish this with volunteers. I mean, everyone they're looking to help is, you know, everyone they put on the island is dying already anyway. So if you make this known, like there's an island that he, you know, that ages. And we're looking for terminal cases for to test out new medicines. You'll get people to come there. You don't need to kidnap families. Yeah, because like the like the whole implication ending kind of made me mad. Like, so they're going to stay in those in those bodies. Like that's not a happy ending. Like they're so mentally sick. And like, you know, in the real war, Shamalon, they would probably be committed. Like in reality, they'd be fucking committed because people be like. They're clearly there's a mental issue here because no one's gonna believe that they're six. Well, to be fair, all they gotta do is like pass a fingerprint test. You still have the fingerprint of a 50-year-old. Yeah, but it's still like your fingerprint doesn't change throughout your life. It'll still be the, the kid, you know, his birth certificate will come up, like they'll see the birth date, like that that'll still be accurate. Yeah, that part's true, but I don't know. I don't see that being a super happy ending like they made it. Oh, no. They're scarred for life, and they don't have the life skills to get a job or anything. They're fucked. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, there's... they Honestly, the, he, Shanlon should have gone with the, the nihilistic ending he was, seemed like to be building towards, which is they all died. Like, I think that would have been a, the, the ending to go with. It's Is it bleak? Is it grim? Yeah, but it's the most appropriate with what you're telling would be that they all die or somehow they can just de-age right when they come out their side like why not you know because the rules for this fucking beach are so fucking flimsy that why not they just come come out the cool ones just de-age they make it up as they go along everyone's like well maybe this place is exactly what they're saying like they just come up with the like the answer out of their fucking ass it's so stupid yeah, some people are clearly aging. Others look like they're not aging at all. Like, I really at no point looked like she was aging. And there's sorry excuse for make her age, other than the hump from the calcium deficiency, was to really overdo her makeup. And I'm like, I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> oh, well, I'm I'm burned out. You got anything else you want to say about old? Uh, it's it's a movie that now exists and I god god damn Shyamalan just god damn it's over it should be over but it won't be he'll have something else in a couple of years and you know what's sad it's going to be a wide release we're still going to have this show and we're going to have to sit through it yeah bummer six I gave this one a three. I know. <laughs> Fuck. Well, hopefully yeah. next week we'll be a little bit more upbeat. <laughs> wow. I wasn't kind to anything that got released this weekend. It was rough. So well, thanks for listening to this bleak ass episode with these shitty movies, everybody. Uh, next week, we're bound to have better films to talk about. We've got the long awaited A24 King Arthur fantasy drama, The Green Knight. Very excited. Uh, Disney's Jungle Cruise, yeah, and Matt Damon and Tom McCarthy's Stillwater, also man. One of those is bound to be good, and in a perfect world, all three of them are. So I guess we'll see. <laughs> uh, don't miss the perfection on Wednesday uh, for Filmgasm and Charlie Chaplin's Monsieur Verdoux on Oscar Sunday. Have a great week and keep watching movies. <laughs>